Well, good morning again, everyone. It's so great to be back and uh, not snowed in. That was sort of nice. This morning, I'm really excited. We're starting a brand new sermon series, really asking the question, how do we do what Christians or what Jesus has called us to do? Really practical. We're going to, just so you know, we're going to look at the book written by Jesus' half-brother, James, and we're going to discover what it means in really practical terms to be a follower of Jesus and all of life's ups and downs. And I'm so excited because this morning we're going to start off by learning some incredible insight about this question. What should we do when suffering hits? What do you do when trials pushes you back and discourages you? And we have to ask the question because it happens. I wish we didn't have to talk about it, but here's one of the hard facts of being a Christian. Jesus, so God's beloved son, he suffered. He experienced tragedy and injustice, things that didn't make sense, things that weren't fair. And people like us who follow the suffering servant, we should expect to suffer too. That's just how it is. I wish it weren't like this, but it's not like you become a Christian and all of a sudden, boom, a portal appears. Like, wouldn't that be nice? Like if uh, you, you, you follow Jesus and all of a sudden you went from normal life into, I don't know, this heavenly dimension. That'd be so cool, right? Like imagine that you uh, follow Jesus and all of a sudden everything starts to go your way. That'd be nice. A world where there's no problems. Imagine you sing the right song and boom, your family never gets the seasonal cold that everybody gets. That'd be so cool, right? Wouldn't that be nice if uh, healthy food, once you become saved, tastes good and uh, unhealthy food tastes bad? <laughs> that'd, that'd, be, that'd make life so much easier, right? That the people around you all of a sudden stop being annoying and uh, there's no more conflicts. And the Philadelphia Eagles don't forget how to play football in December. Like, it'd be so nice if being a Christian meant everything went your way, but it doesn't. In fact, following Jesus, well, it looks like being like Jesus. Sometimes it looks like suffering. And that can really be hard, especially when you don't expect the Christian life to look like Jesus' life. So here's what we're talking about. The fact that suffering, trials, James calls it, can set you back. Now, to be clear, this isn't a religious faith thing. Obstacles can get in the way of any good thing you want to do. Dumb example, this year I start off with, uh, I was going to be, this was going to be the year that I started to exercise. And I did for like two days in a row. It was great. And then I got sick. Uh, and and it, being sick was a question. How committed am I to doing this thing, or will any bump stop me? And for me, it's the second one. Uh, maybe I'll exercise next January. I've got some time to think about it. But uh, I, I hate to admit it, all it took was a couple sniffles, and I gave up on the good thing that I thought I should do. I, I need a break. <laughs> and uh, it's not just me, right? We all do this. In fact, that's how gyms make their money. People sign up, and then they don't go because one little thing gets in the way. It's cold out. I'll stay home. This is everywhere all the time. We all do this. We want to be better parents, and we know what to do until one of the kids throws a tantrum, and then, bam, there we are in our old habits. We go, this year, we're going to stick to a budget, and then you get in a sad rut, and Amazon Prime works so good, right? Suffering sadness, bumps, is all a test. Disappointment is a trial, and you learn a lot about yourself. Will you keep going? Or do you let a setback set you back from the good thing that you're supposed to do? Now, one of the reasons why suffering and disappointments mess you up is because it's confusing. It disorients you. Disappointment tells you something. And we're not sure what to do about it. And this is what happens. We have this assumption that doing the right thing should be easy. Or at least that we get rewarded quick. Like I ran on a treadmill for two days in a row. So I shouldn't get sick. I should be healthy, right? That's, that's why you exercise, right? 
I, I pray in faith so you'd think that my problems that day would automatically get better and not worse. And when it doesn't, it gets confusing. I love my kids, so they should eat their dinner, but it doesn't really work that way. And that, that messes you up. When you see a trial, it kind of messes up how you think about stuff. We're programmed to believe that doing the right thing leads to a better destination right away. When it doesn't happen, it's a conflicting message, and it messes us up. And most people, it's really natural, we consider suffering. We listen to it, and we consider trials to prove hopelessness or push against faith. Trials tell you that you might as well give up, or we just don't think about it. So some of us get discouraged, we get fearful, it's everywhere around us. Or we escape into the next thing that will distract us from thinking about it. Social media, normal media, noise, substances. We, ha we don't know how to think about hardship, so we avoid it or we run away. The problem that circumstances, life, community, health, goals... All of the disappointment and suffering that you encounter becomes a test about what you really believe about a good God who loves you. And in those moments, it becomes an obstacle to, that gets in the way of doing whatever Jesus tells you to do. Now, we're going to talk about it. It's a topic that's hard to bring up. It's easy to ignore, escape, or gloss over, but today we're going to do the hard work of talking about it. And I'm so excited because if you can figure out how to get past obstacles, you're going to have the power to follow Jesus wherever he calls you. And we're just going to read what God has to say to people like us who want to do what Jesus tells us to do, but we get confused by obstacles. We're in the book of James. I'm just going to read... Well, I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 2. You can follow along in your Bible, handout, or screen. But here's what James says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So here's our topic for today. There it is. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, what do you do next? Now, this, this last line here is a big category of things. It's the stuff you fall into. Trials, what kind? Well, many kinds. It covers disappointments, setbacks, annoyances, tragedies, adversities. And if you're like really, if you're one of these really strict literal Bible readers and you're like, well, what kinds of trials is it? Well, many kinds. Like this is a giant bucket that you sort of put all your ick into, all the setback, disappointment, conflict, Cancer, divorce, finances, it, it's, just, it's just everything. Many kinds. The question is, this is our topic, what do you do when that's your thing? How do you keep going? And why in the world is this happening? Now, most people, like everybody has hardship. Most people consider hardship something to avoid. And if you can't avoid it, we consider it as a reason to lose hope or lose motivation. Trials of many kinds tends to build up fear and takes away faith. But James says, instead of considering that situation that way, what if instead of zooming in and focusing on the overwhelming mountainous nature of your problems, what if faith could help you to zoom out a bit and get some perspective. What if you could see joy? Like that's, that is a difficult thing to think about. We have to talk about joy. Now, joy in the Bible isn't, well, I'll say this, it's more than an emotional state. It's probably not what you think about joy. One commentator puts it this way. He says, joy proves to be quite different from happiness. In other words, this verse doesn't support the notion that Christians can only walk around smiling all the time. That, that's not a life of faith. Bad stuff happens, and you have emotions, and you react to it. 
Joy, this commentator says, based on lots of scripture, can be defined as, quote, a settled contentment in every situation or an unnatural reaction of deep, steady, and unadulterated, thankful rest in God. I got to read this again. This is what faith and worship calls you to do. A settled contentment in every situation. That's joy. Being content. Not just the good situations, not just the bad situation. Being content in whatever. Or, the commentator says, an unnatural state of deep, steady, thankful trust in God to, in any situation, be somehow content, somehow grateful. Can you imagine how different that is from what most of us do? How different would your life be if the obstacle drove you toward gratitude, if it nudged you toward trust? Can you imagine how different we'd all be if each setback was a building block in your life to make you more spiritual, grateful, and resilient? I mean, think about how your life would be if each hardship fueled spiritual growth instead of discouragement. If each obstacle pushed you to be closer to and more like Jesus. I mean, that'd be amazing, right? We would all be such mountains of steadfast, secure, faithful people if somehow our each disappointment build us up to be more like Christ. But for that to happen, you'd have a couple questions, right? The first question would be the question that we all ask when we encounter trials or sufferings of any kind. In most people, we all ask the same question. What is it? Why me? God, why would you possibly allow suffering to make it hard on me instead of making it easy on me, right? Why? Why? And here's what James says. This is the second verse we'll talk about. He says, because, well, because you know or you should know that it is the testing of your faith that produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So why might God allow the hard things that you'd rather avoid? Maybe, this is one answer, the truth is God uses hard things to build strong character. James says somehow, you may not like them, you would prefer if they were gone, but God is big enough to use your challenge to make you bigger and stronger for the next challenge. This is one thing that makes life exciting. Like I've got kids that play video games, and do do you know what they call a game that doesn't have any hard puzzles, without bosses, no levels to conquer. You know what they call that? It's a boring game, right? No one likes those games. My kids crack me up, they'll play the games, they'll fight the bosses, and this happens a bunch of times a day. Bowser will beat them up, and Bowser laughs at little Mario and Luigi, and my kids get so upset because they just got tossed off whatever. But instead of giving up, my kids, I've never heard them go, Bowser beat me up, I hate the Mario Brothers. No, you know what they do? They go, I love it. Because somehow the fact that I'm losing motivates me to get better at it. Do you know how babies learn how to walk? They fall a lot. You find a toddler with bruises on the knees, you've got someone learning how to walk well. Christians grow in character through setback and suffering on the way toward maturity and completeness. Somehow this skill of getting back up and the ability to keep on keeping on is going, you see this language, this is so interesting to me. Uh, Verse four, let perseverance finish its work as though perseverance is somebody working on you like like a coach to help you go up a mountain to, to help you, something specifically, Uh, so that you're mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
somehow, when you hit that crisis, when you hit that hard conversation, the difficulty with kids, conflict with your partner, a challenge at your job, instead of running away from it, James says that maybe the right perspective allows you to rejoice because you're making progress. That's reason one, why? Why might God allow this? Well, because God can use even difficult things to make you stronger. This is a good answer. Uh, I'll be honest, it's sort of predictable. It's the bumper sticker, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, which isn't easy. It doesn't always make sense. It uh, honestly doesn't always seem like it works. Because when suffering happens, most of you don't go, isn't it great that God didn't answer the prayer because I get to learn this lesson? We don't do that. We do what everyone goes, says, God, if you're really there, this still doesn't make sense. Why is this happening? It's really hard to be content and grateful and consider hard things with joy because you're like, sure, good answer. Maybe this will make me stronger. Maybe, I don't know, maybe learning how to grieve will make me stronger. Maybe me having cancer will help me help someone else. But you know what else would be great, God? Not losing that loved one. That'd be good too. Not going through this. Because we all go, that's a good good answer, but like, wouldn't it be better if I didn't have this tragedy? I could read a book to learn a lesson. I don't need to go through it. Uh, We do this, right? It doesn't always make sense. And, And James gets this. So here's my take on what he says next. Sometimes that doesn't make sense. And when you can't see it, when you can't imagine how when you go through the valley of the shadow of death and you're like, I think God's here, that's great, but why do I have to be here? When you don't get a great answer and context, I think James is saying to do this. This is the next verse. If any of you lack wisdom, ask God. Ask God. And and I think this is specifically talking about wisdom for going through trials and not understanding. Going, God, can you give me wisdom to be joyful and content because I'm not and I'm not because this doesn't make any sense. James says, this is provocative. When you pray like that, it's not something to be ashamed of. Praying like that isn't a sign of weakness or small faith it seems to be an indication of growth. Because James continues, God, God gives generously to all who ask that without finding fault. Ask and it will be given to you. Fascinating to me. Uh, and again, I think this is specifically about asking for, it, God, how do I figure this out in trials? And I think I love this line, God doesn't find fault, because I think there are people who will find you at fault if you are too rocked by trials. And a lot of us don't pray like this, because to be fair, there are people who may look down on you if you sort of have a crisis of faith because you can't figure out why suffering is happening. There are people who go, you know, real Christians are stronger than this. But do you know who doesn't have fault with you? God. God doesn't find fault with people like me who can't figure out why this is happening. And we go, God, help me figure it out. God seems to love it when people do this. Important clarification here. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. He talks about this for a while. The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. I could flesh this out. Here's my take. I think that there's a certain kind of person who asks, but with the wrong intention. Not everybody who asks questions really wants answers. And James points out what you all know. There's a difference between going, God, I know you're real. I trust you. I don't get this. And God loves that person. God loves when you as a person of faith ask God for wisdom. But there's a different kind of person to ask the question. You could also ask the same exact question going, well, here's yet another bad thing. 
another stack of proof that demonstrates that there's no God, prove me wrong? That's a very different question. God, if you're real, you'd make sense, but you're not is a very different sort of question. That's not faith. That's double-minded. And God loves it when we, like children, come to him for wisdom. He seems less interested in defending himself against critics. I think this is James saying, when you don't understand, go to God like a child, not like a professor. There's one more thing that James says will help you in trials. Again, here's my take on why I think James goes here. I I think psychologically, when you zoom out on all of your suffering and trials, you'll notice this isn't everything. But so many of the things that rock us, make us sad, discourage us, so much of it is temporary. You know the expression, time will heal all wounds? I mean, it doesn't. But the reason why you think it does is that so many of our wounds are so temporary. And James, in his next couple verses, makes a point that what really matters probably isn't all the things that get you upset. And what will help you is to zoom out a bit and focus on what really matters. We are living for eternity. What might help you is to realize that the things that may get you the most upset last a very short amount of time. What we need to focus on are the things that last forever. So instead of being upset when you hit his example as a financial trial, James says believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. And if you're in a humble spot, financially, you may wonder what can I be proud of. James says, look, be proud because even if you've got a setback financially, you've got God as your father and you are living for forever. (laughs) Then verse 10, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation. So they'll pass away like a wild flower. In other words, all the stuff that we live for, if you're rich, and most of us are very rich compared to the globe and history, we can find our confidence, our identity, who we are, and what we've got for now. But instead, we should be more humble. We should be prideful about the things that most people don't see, our relationship with our God. Money is just stuff. Find your confidence in things like faith and family and legacy and influence, the stuff that lasts longer than a dandelion is what he's saying. Verse 11 says, The sun rises with scorching heat, withers of plant, blossoms fail, beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Which is a long way of saying, don't make what you have the thing that's your identity. It's like the old saying, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul, right? Live for something bigger than the things that are messing you up right now. The funny thing is the things that I think affect us more than anything else, the, the, the wins, the losses. James says, maybe in the light of eternity, the things that you're so upset about, your life is much bigger than all that. All the stuff fades away. That's the first lesson of the book of James. And this is what I believe God is telling you today. To do whatever Jesus tells you to do and not let trials set you back. Don't let discouragement discourage you. And there are some very real things that we encounter, but instead, a life of faith is a life of joy in the right perspective and hope with eternity. So long story short, don't let suffering stop you. I think that's what God's telling you to do today. That God's called you to do something. that You ought to do it, and don't let trials push you back. That's our sermon today. But I, I can't end it as we go to the Lord's table without reflecting on someone else who had suffering, but he didn't let it stop him. And this isn't fair because if there's anyone who God should have protected from suffering, you think it'd be Jesus, right? 
God's only beloved son. But the cross behind me is a symbol. You can see it here. This is a symbol of the Christian faith. It's also a torture device. This is something that inflicted pain and injustice. We worship and follow someone who experienced unspeakable pain. And he endured, he kept going for the, fit, for the prize set before him with joy, with tears coming down his eyes, being mocked, crucified. Jesus, I mean, he, he had supper with his disciples, knowing what was going to happen next. And he had this unnatural reaction of deep contentment and trust in God, like, like, like we ought to which drove him toward victory. And as we celebrate communion, you need to know this. Following Jesus means not letting suffering stop you from what God's called you to do. I don't know exactly what God's called you to do. Maybe you're not a Christian, and the reason is because you see so much injustice and you don't understand how God can work through evil. Like Maybe God's calling you to him despite that. Maybe today you're discouraged by so many things to get discouraged about. And I want you to hear God's word telling you to keep going toward joy and contentment. Rather, maybe there's something that you've been avoiding because it's hard. Or it's, it's hard to keep going. And I, I just don't know exactly what God is calling you to do specifically. But here's what I am pretty sure about. Whatever God is calling you to do, it looks like this. It looks like considering it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So folks, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be full and complete, not lacking anything. So Father in heaven, we find ourselves here beneath the cross of Jesus, we find ourselves often confronted with disappointment and injustice. We can get overwhelmed by things that may be short-term and temporary, but they are awfully heavy on our shoulders. So Father, I pray that as we make our home within this wilderness, I pray that you would show us how you make beautiful things out of bad ones, that you redeem difficulty, and that you can somehow, in the light of eternity, make all the disappointment we encounter work out for our good. As we approach the table, help us to think about your sacrifice, help us to be thankful for the love that you've shown us, and can you help us to courageously follow you wherever you lead. I ask this all in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.